AWS has been offering cloud computing services to businesses across the globe since 2006. Critical to their success is that they've constantly built and delivered newer technologies and solutions to meet their customers' needs. Today, AWS has over 200 technology services. As a result of their organic growth and clear vision to serve their customers, you're likely to come across services that seem to do similar things. Identity and access management services are no different. Because as a crucial security foundation service, ensuring that only the right people and processes can access your resources and data is vital. So whether you're looking to streamline developer access to AWS resources or provide a seamless authentication experience for your end customers, AWS has you covered. Join us in this video as we explore the array of identity management tools available on AWS, helping you select the perfect tool for your unique case. And so we'll look at three different identity services that AWS offers. There's the AWS Identity and Access Management Service, the Identity Center, and then there's Amazon Cognito. Let's do this. So let's start off by taking a look at the AWS Identity and Access Management Service, also known as IAM. This was in fact the original identity and access management solution that AWS offered as part of their services. So when it comes to IAM, you have obviously the AWS cloud and you would need to create an AWS account within which you would have a vast array of services that you can access to create resources to host your applications. So essentially the way how it works is you've got a wide range of services, compute network storage databases, and then you create resources upon which you deploy your application. So in this case, if we take the example of our Richer Roast company, which is a coffee shop organization, assume that they would require a vast array of services like compute, databases, and obviously not to forget good old fashioned Amazon S3 storage services. We would need a means to allow our users to access these services. And so as an example, we could have Alice, who's our senior systems administrator and works for the Richer Roast company. Now, she might require access to a number of services in our AWS account in order to create various services, deploy some EC2 instances, spin up some S3 buckets, and so on. Now, in order for us to allow Alice to access our AWS account and perhaps spin up some EC2 instances or work with our S3 environment to create some buckets, we need to be able to verify her identity and also grant her the necessary permissions to do just the tasks required to carry out a job function. That's known as principle of least privilege. And we use an identity and access management solution to offer a couple of things. One is authentication. And that's where we verify our identity. And the other is authorization. That's where once we've verified our identity, we give her certain permissions to do the job she needs to do. And on the AWS platform, our classic original service for identity and access management that can grant authentication and authorization services is the AWS Identity and Access Management Service, also known as IAM. Now at IAM, we would create an IAM user account an account that represents Alice. And then to enable Alice to access those services that she needs to use, we would create IAM policies, which are permissions that specify exactly what Alice can or cannot do in this AWS account. These permissions are attached to Alice's IAM user account. And once the account has been configured, we would be able to create a set of credentials that Alice can use to authenticate against the account. She could either use a set of usernames and password to gain console-based access or a set of access keys if she's programmatically accessing the AWS account using the command line interface as an example. Once Alice's IAM user account is in place and we have the permissions necessary for her to carry out a job function attached to that account, she can then log into the AWS account and access those services that she needs to carry out her job function. And so the AWS IAM service allows us to create IAM user accounts that represent our users, our colleagues, or members of staff who need to access our AWS account and carry out various job functions, spin up servers, deploy the databases, create S3 buckets, and anything else in order to help us work on the AWS platform and provision our resources and our applications on the AWS platform. Now, the AWS IAM service does a lot more than this. Let's take a look at some of its other features. 
Now, as well as creating IAM users on the AWS platform, using the IAM Identity and Access Management Service, you can also create IAM groups. IAM groups are really beneficial because they allow you to club together users that form part of a common job function. For example, your developers, or your database administrators, or your system administrators, your server administrators, and so on. And when you create IAM groups, you can actually assign permissions to the group. And that means that the users that are members of that group will inherit those permissions. Remember, with permissions, you get to dictate exactly what an IAM user can and cannot do in your AWS account. This allows you to follow the principle of least privilege to ensure that members of your organization are permitted only those set of permissions that allow them to carry out their job function. And so in this example, our IAM user Menio is able to log into the AWS account and work with just the RDS service. Let's take a look at another feature of the IAM service. Another feature that AWS IAM offers you is the ability to create something called an IAM role. Now, an IAM role is an independent identity that can be assumed by any entity with the permissions to do so. An IAM role will then grant temporary credentials to that entity to services and resources based on a set of predefined policies. Okay, that sounds a bit like a mouthful, so let's try and assimilate what that actually means. Essentially, an IAM role is similar to an IAM user, except that it doesn't really belong to one specific user identity. It's an independent identity. It's an identity that can be assumed by other entities and depending on the permissions that are assigned to the role, those entities can perform certain actions. Now, those entities do not necessarily need to be only IAM users, not just human users. For example, let's take our EC2 instance running in the EC2 platform. Let's assume that you have an application running on that EC2 instance that then needs to update an Amazon S3 bucket with some log files. How would you allow the EC2 instance and the application that runs on it, the ability to communicate with Amazon S3 and have the permissions to put log files into the bucket. You'd use an IAM role. So an IAM role will allow you to attach a set of permissions to it that will enable the EC2 instance to perform that put operation or that put action. And then you would attach the IAM role to the EC2 instance. The EC2 instance would then be able to connect to the Amazon S3 bucket and upload the log files to the archive bucket. In other words, with IAM roles, you can allow entities and resources sufficient level of permissions to perform actions against other services and resources on the AWS platform. Similarly, you might have a Lambda function that performs certain tasks to data stored in an S3 bucket, creating thumbnails of your images, for example. In order to allow the Lambda function to access the S3 bucket, it would need a set of permissions. And you would do that by assigning it an IAM role with the set of permissions that it can use in order to perform that operation against the S3 bucket. Now, IAM roles are a lot more versatile than just simply allowing your resources to talk to each other. Let's assume that you have multiple AWS accounts. So currently we're in the Richer Rose production account, but you might have some other accounts, the development account, the test account, the product account, the experimentation account, the list goes on and on. Assume that Alice needs to access the dev account to provision some resources in a development environment. How would she go about doing that? You could create another IAM user account for her in the development account using the IAM service in the development account, and that's fine but it just means that Alice needs to remember two sets of credentials and two sets of passwords. And it becomes even worse when you have 200 accounts. Now with IAM roles, you don't need to create multiple user accounts across all of your AWS accounts. For Alice to be able to access the resources in the development account, she can instead assume a role. Let's take a look at how that works. In the development account, you would create an IAM role and attach a policy to it that defines the permissions assigned to the role. So for example, let's say that Alice needs to access Amazon EC2 to spin up some EC2 instances and maybe S3 for creating some buckets. You would then define within the role and its permission set a trust policy. 
identifying who is being trusted to assume this role. In this case, it would be Alice. You would identify Alice by the fact that she is in a different account and use the account ID to identify that user in that account. And so within the IM role, you would create this trust policy that says this role trusts Alice in the production account. Next, within the production account, you would have to create another policy using IAM that allows Alice to actually assume that role in the development account. So it's a two-phased approach. Once you've got these roles and policies and permissions in place, Alice can perform something called a role switch operation to perform the cross account access needed in order to access the development account, spin up a servers and create her S3 buckets. Brilliant. We don't need to have Alice remembering 200 different usernames and passwords. Likewise, if you have a third party service provider or a business partner that needs to access resources in your account, you don't need to create IAM accounts for them in your AWS account. You can just use IAM roles and grant temporary access to the resources and services in your AWS account. Now, AWS IAM also allows you to federate identities with an on-premise identity provider. So if you have an on-premise network running something like Microsoft Active Directory and you have all of your developers, database administrators, and all the other staff members in that organization that need access to this AWS account. With Identity Federation, they can access the AWS account using temporary credentials and the permissions would be defined by a set of IAM roles. So IAM roles becomes really, really beneficial in the fact that it offers temporary credentials to entities, both human and non-human entities, the ability to access resources and services. It allows for cross-account access, which means that you can ensure that users are created in perhaps one identities account and then give them permission to perform role switch operations to access other accounts, limiting their scope by the permission sets that you defined for them. Another key benefit of using IAM roles is the fact that when you create an IAM role, you don't have to create usernames and passwords. You don't have to create a set of access keys. Those type of credentials are what we call long-term credentials. Instead, what IAM role does is it works with a service called the Amazon Security Token Service, the Amazon SDS service, to dynamically generate a set of credentials when required. And those credentials expire after a short period of time. And that way, IAM roles will allow entities to access resources using temporary credentials. The benefit of that is you don't have to worry about things like password rotation or key rotation. You don't have to worry about password policies and all that other administrative effort that is involved when creating user accounts. And so one of the drawbacks of IAM when you're creating IAM users is obviously the need to maintain long-term credentials and a mechanism to secure those long-term credentials. So you might incorporate password policies with complexity as well as the fact that you have to rotate those credentials on a regular basis. So you wanna change your password every 42 days or every 90 days. Another drawback with using IAM, especially when it comes to performing this cross account access, is the fact that it is a bit of a complex operation. You need to create an IAM role with a trust policy, and then you need to create another policy that allows the, ent the identity to assume that role. And then you need to perform something called a role switch operation. It's a bit complex. I'm actually gonna show you an example about how this works in real life. So let's jump into the AWS Management Console and let's perform a role switch operation for our friend Alice. Okay, so here we are in my AWS Management Accounts. On my left, I'm logged in to the AWS Management Account for my organization, and I'm actually logged in as an IAM user called Alice. On the right, I'm logged into the Development Account as the root user. Now. If we take a look at the IAM users that have been created in the management account, you'll see I have two users in there. I've got Alice and myself, Rajesh. And on the right, I've got an IAM dashboard as well for the development account within which I have configured and set up seven different IAM user accounts, but there's no Alice in there. Now, obviously, if Alice needs to access the development account, I could create an IAM user account for her in the development account, give her the credentials, but then we know that problem. She's gonna to have to remember two sets 
of credentials, two sets of usernames, passwords. It's a bit too much for Alice. Anyway, with cross-account access and the use of IAM roles, I don't need to do any of that. Once I've created the necessary IAM roles and the permission policies and trust policies as discussed in the last slide, I'm all good to go. I can, from this account, switch roles into the development account. So Alice can go and click on her name and click on switch role. And then she will need to provide the account ID of the account she's trying to switch into. So here's the development account. I'll grab the account ID very quickly, paste it in here. And then we know which account we're trying to switch into. Next, we need to provide the IAM role name, the name of the role that we're going to assume. So in the development account, there is a role that has been created. And in fact, it is called the organization account access role. Now this was created with the AWS organization service, but that's a topic for a different video. So I'm gonna actually use that role name because that's got all the trust policies in place. And then I can also provide a display name. So something like Alice on development. Okay, now she's on the development account and we can provide a color. So let's choose blue, for instance, and then we can switch roles. What's happening? Alice is now logging into the development account using cross account access and an IAM role from the development account that grants her that access. You will notice that if I click on users in the development account, I've got these users. Those same users are now displayed on the left hand side. And so now Alice is in the development account and she can carry out all of the tasks in the development account based on the permissions that are assigned to that role that she assumed earlier. Brilliant. She doesn't need to remember multiple usernames and passwords. And the best part about this is that this role is providing Alice with a set of temporary credentials, which will expire after a period of time. As long as she continues to have permissions to assume the role, she can continue renewing those credentials dynamically. She doesn't have to remember usernames and passwords. We don't have to create usernames and passwords for the role to rotate and manage and worry about password policies and all that jazz. And so this is an absolutely brilliant way of switching between accounts for your members of staff. Right, now that we have looked at how this all works, in case you're interested in setting up IAM roles and cross account access for your organization, I've got a video over here, uh, the link of which is also in the description box below that will allow you and walk you through that entire process. Now, cross account access is brilliant and it works fantastic, but it does have certain drawbacks. There's all this role switching that you have to keep doing. And it's not seamless. You need to create these trust policies and, and all the other stuff. AWS offers a different identity service called the Identity Center, which overcomes the drawbacks of standard cross-account access. In fact, the AWS Identity Center, which we're gonna talk about next, is designed specifically for multi-account environments and enabling your users to access those accounts. Let's do that next. The AWS Identity Center is relatively a new kid on the block and it's recommended for services where you wanna manage human users to access your AWS resources. You could think of it as a single place to manage all of your workforce identities with consistent access across multiple accounts and applications within your AWS organization. The AWS Identity Center takes away a lot of the administrative burden that's associated with managing workforce users in AWS IAM. So let's take a look at how it works. Most organizations will have multiple AWS accounts. I've got the Richard Roast Limited's management account over here. And in addition to that, I probably have a dev account, a test account, and a production account with workloads and services that I'm gonna use across those accounts in order to support the different environments of my application lifecycle. Now it's generally recommended best practices to separate out your different environments across different accounts because this allows for isolation and also reduces the blast radius of any disasters that may occur in perhaps your experimentation account. When using the AWS Identity Center, you would need to initially set up AWS Organizations. AWS Organizations is a service that allows you to manage multiple AWS accounts collectively, both from a cost management perspective, 
but also from ensuring that all of your accounts are secure and follow stringent policies that you define as to what services and resources can be consumed within those accounts. With the AWS organization service in place, you can then configure AWS Identity Center. Now, when it comes to actually configuring Identity Center, you need to define an identity provider. Your identity provider can be either the Identity Center's native identity provider itself, or it could be Microsoft Active Directory or some form of external identity provider. This is absolutely brilliant because what this means is that you can have a single source of truth and you can ensure that you reduce your overall management burden by managing and looking after just a single identity provider. So your identity center can integrate with Microsoft Active Directory. Brilliant. Or you may choose to obviously use the identity center's inbuilt native identity provider. Now with the identity center enabled, you can then set up groups, your developers group, server administrators, systems administrators, the list goes on and on. And within those groups, you can define users in the same way as you did with IAM. But the difference here is that with each of these users, you would actually set up their individual identity center user ID. You would need to provide an email address so that they can recover their email passwords if they need to reset it. And the process is entirely seamless, similar to a typical sort of identity service for end users. You would also, <clears throat> your identity center is also aware of all of the accounts that are part of your AWS organization. So I've got my dev account, my test account, and my product account. And your identity center has seamless visibility across all of those accounts. With the users and groups in place, you can then define what are called permission sets. Permission sets allow you to define exactly what your users can or cannot do in your AWS accounts. In fact, you set up permission sets by defining AWS managed policies. These could be AWS own managed policies or your custom managed policies, which are defined in IAM. So your managed policies are pulled from IAM. So there's an integration there. Or you could create inline policies within Identity Center itself and attach them to the individual accounts, defining what permissions your users and groups have in those accounts. Another key feature of permission sets is that it allows you to define temporary permissions. Okay, so you stipulate just how long those permissions and those credentials are valid for. And this is where the temporary credential element comes in. With your groups and users in place and your permissions defined, you can then select your accounts and identify which groups are able to access those accounts and what sets of permissions you are applying to those groups in those accounts. So our developers may be granted the ability to log into the development account and the permission sets will restrict what they can and cannot do within those accounts. And with all of this in place, your developers are then able to access your AWS accounts through a central portal, a portal that gives them visibility across the various accounts that they need access to. And then simply clicking into the portal, choosing either web console access or CLI access, they can access the relevant accounts that they have permissions to get into. Now, in addition to enabling your users to be able to access all of your AWS accounts through a single pane of glass, AWS Identity Center also integrates with on-premises network through Federation, and it actually allows you to build single sign-on services through external third-party applications. For example, Microsoft Office 365, Salesforce, and Slack are just some of the examples of the applications that you can integrate with Identity Center. So when it comes to the Identity Center, you've got seamless access to multiple accounts in your AWS organization, and your Identity Center users are assigned with temporary credentials to access resources. The identities that you create will have their own set of usernames and passwords, but when it comes to actually logging onto AWS services, the permission sets dictate exactly how long those passwords or those credentials are valid for, and then they would need to re-log in again in order to continue access. Okay, so next I want to talk to you about the AWS Cognito service. Now this is an identity service designed for your application users. Okay, so you've got your web and mobile apps and you may need to develop some form of identity management system for the end users that are accessing your mobile apps or your web applications. It's an authorization service for OAuth 2.0 access tokens and AWS credentials. And you can authenticate and authorize users from built-in user directories, or even use external directories with external identity providers from the likes of Amazon, Google, and Facebook. 
as examples. Now, when it comes to Cognito, there are two types of pools that you can create. There's the user pool, which is more about authentication services. And then there's the identity pool, which gives temporary access to backend resources and services on the AWS platform. Let's take a look at user pools first. So we've got our AWS cloud and within the AWS cloud, you can provision the Amazon Cognito service. Now, when it comes to provisioning the Cognito service, you would create a user pool and or a user and an identity pool. With a user pool in place, this will allow you to define things like your users. It will allow you to create groups. And in the same way as you have end user groups, for example, readers, editors, contributors, administrators, owners, that kind of thing for your application to separate out different types of users, you could create groups to separate out different types of levels of access for your users. You can then create your actual end users that will be part of a given group, for example. Now, these users will be provisioned with a particular username and password to log into the Cognito interface. And Amazon Cognito allows you to create multiple groups. And in addition to that, you can add security to the way how your groups access your applications with things like multi-factor authentication. Once you have all of this in place, you can also configure a UI interface for sign up and sign in. So Cognito provides you with the ability of creating something called a hosted user interface to allow for your end users to sign up for the service and then subsequently sign into the service. Now you can either use Cognito's hosted UI service or you can create your own custom UI if you wish. With all of these configuration items in place, your users can then access your application, authenticate against the Cognito platform and obtain tokens. Okay, so they would authenticate against Cognito and get tokens. And these tokens can then be used to access APIs to your backend applications using something like the Amazon API Gateway, which will ultimately give you access to backend services and APIs running on maybe Lambda containers or your EC2 instances. Ultimately, with the Amazon Cognito user pool service, you can provide authentication services and then create tokens to be able to grant access to APIs to backend applications running on the AWS platform. Let's talk about identity pools next because that gives you some additional features. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about identity pools. Now we've got Amazon Cognito in place with a user pool that handles all of the authentication element for your users that are coming in to access your application. With identity pools, what you do is you basically create identities and assign these identities to your users or guests and authorize them to receive AWS credentials to access some backend services. And so ultimately, when you present proof of authentication to an identity pool in the form of a trusted claim from say a SAML 2.0 ID or some sort of social ID provider, you associate your user with an identity in the identity pool. And then the token that your identity pool creates in the identity and the token that your identity pool creates for the identity can retrieve temporary credentials from the Amazon Security Token Service to then go ahead and access some backend services. Let's take a look at how this works. So you can assign roles based on the various identities that you create in the identity pool and different roles can specify different levels of access. So for instance, the contributor of a particular web application can have the ability to write to that application, whereas readers can only have read-only access. And in addition to that, you can actually also create guest users within identity pools because you may have certain portions of your website that is accessible for anonymous users, for example. So that can be set up as well. Nevertheless, when your users come to actually access backend services, they would access the application, authenticate against the user pool and retrieve tokens. Okay, so they would authenticate and get tokens. Those tokens will then be exchanged for AWS credentials and these credentials are temporary credentials and then subsequently using those credentials they will be able to access AWS services and backend services such as DynamoDB tables, Amazon S3 buckets that they can write to and read from depending on the level of permissions that they have and the role that's been assigned to that identity or even Amazon workspaces for example if they're um, accessing a virtual desktop in the cloud. Again, we have the same principles where your identity pools can make use of external ID providers. So that's also integrated as part of the overall offering. 
But the best thing about identity pools is the fact that you can ensure role-based access control where Amazon Cognito will choose a role that it will assign to a given identity based on your specifications. So for instance, as I mentioned earlier, a contributor to a particular web application, say for example, in the marketing department would have just the necessary permissions to be able to write to that application. Whereas those users who are perhaps in just the readers group will only have necessary read permissions to retrieve data from that marketing application. You can also configure access controls based on attributes. So your identity pool can read attributes from your user's claims and map them to principal tags in your user's temporary session. So let's say, for example, if you have a tag where the key is name and the value is marketing, then a user that comes in that's able to validate themselves as being part of that department will be given certain levels of permission. So for example, the ability to read a specific bucket in the S3 environment that's meant for only those marketing individuals in the marketing department. And so using a combination of attributes access control and rule-based access control, you can ensure secure and principle of least privilege access to your backend services using both your user pools and then subsequently your identity pools for granting that level of access. So Cognito ultimately designed to enable your application users with a form of authentication and authorization. And this particular service is then designed for end users, users that would use your applications hosted on the AWS platform. And so I thought I'll give you a quick demonstration how the Cognito user pool service works when it's integrated with an application and offers a hosted UI service. So this web page is essentially just a demonstration application. It's uh, by a fictitious company called To Do Plus, and it's a to-do list application to list out all of your to-dos, basically. And if I just do a quick refresh, what this does is it integrates with Amazon Cognito in the back end using its hosted UI. This is fully customizable, obviously. You've got a sign-up capability and a sign-in capability. So I could sign up with, for instance, a user called Alice, and let's say that her email address is something like this. and then she would provide a password. And when you create an account, Amazon Cognito verifies that uh, account creation by sending an email to the registered email address. So I'm just gonna click okay to that. And then I'm gonna go into my email and confirm the sign up by providing a verification code that would have been sent to my email address. So just give me a second. Okay, and this is the email that I get from the verification email service within Cognito to say your verification code is such and such, and then I can go back and provide that verification code to confirm the account creation. And so it says account verified, please log in to continue. So now I can log in with that email address, put in the password, and then we are logged in. And this is just a simple um, task to-do list application, so I can create tasks. Now that I'm logged in, I'm accessing my backend services through an API gateway. Uh, complete video on IAM. Okay, the due date is, let's do it for today. And the status is currently in progress and we'll click submit. And obviously then using the API gateway, I'm able to access the backend services. If you are interested in learning how to deploy this particular application, we've got other videos and other courses that you can take a look at. But it's a fully fledged multi-tier uh, application that allows you to understand how you can use the various services on AWS. Anyway, without digressing away too much, if I go back into Amazon Cognito, so this is my Cognito service, and I click on user pools, and I've got my user pools. And in fact, I've got this account over here, which is the account that's relevant to the account I just signed up with in order to get access to this to-do list application. And so just to reiterate, Amazon Web Services offers different types of identity services. You've got AWS Identity and Access Management, which was the original IAM service on the AWS platform. To help facilitate better integration with workforce identities, you've got the AWS Identity Center. And then to facilitate creation management of your end users for your web and mobile application, we've got Amazon Cognito. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you.